everyone. I'm Ryan Silverio, Executive Director of ASEAN Soji Caucus. Welcome to the Hear Queer Stories podcast series with the theme, Intersecting Rainbows, Progress, Challenges, and Solidarity Within the Queer Movements. This episode series is created by ASEAN Soji Caucus, an organization that aims to magnify voices of queer communities in Southeast Asia. We hope that this can help strengthen and give inspiration to the communities despite the adversities and challenges we all face. In the making of this podcast series, we collaborate with three young Indonesian activists, Ayunita, Purba, and Krishna. This episode is hosted by Krishna. Okay, uh, hi Adil. It's finally nice to, to meet you uh, face-to-face uh, online. Yeah, thank you so much, Krishna, uh, for inviting me for this session. I'm really excited. Uh, it's been a hectic week post-1975 Good Vibes um, that re- um, scenario that recently happened in Malaysia. So, um, But at the same time, I'm really excited that um, you sort of want to have this discussion, you know, intersecting um, queer activism and environmentalism, which are two topics that need to be sort of like um, coordinated together. So thank you so much for inviting me. Yeah, I believe it is a very important issue because uh, we as a queer people uh, are not immune to environmental crisis. And in fact, that we should act actually active in participating. So I think before we start dive into the question, uh, let's talk about you a little bit. Uh, could you... Uh, introduce yourself to uh, to ASC listeners uh, for a, for a bit. Yeah, for uh, for sure. And uh, well, my name is Idil Iman. Um, I am a climate justice activist based in Kuala Lumpur, Malaysia. Uh, I'm 24 years old. Uh, I'm still in my undergraduate program, um, so I'm still studying studying international relations with a minor in environmental studies. Um, I am a queer person living in Malaysia. Um, and I find different ways to in- intersect climate justice uh, and how it relates to uh, LGBTQ persons and the experiences of LGBTQ people in related to um, how climate change is impacting their lives. Um, so I do this through a platform on Instagram called um, Queer Ecology. Uh, the Queer Ecology Project um, sort of is a curatorship um, sort of project that highlights the experiences, uh, the vulnerabilities of queer people in Malaysia and the wider Southeast Asia region, um, and how um, those people are affected by climate change effects, um, such as heat waves, flooding, um, uh, strong storm cyclones, and so on. Um, So I've been really fortunate to have uh, this discussion um, with a lot of queer activists in Malaysia, and uh, they've gone really supportive of my work, um, both in queer activism and in climate justice as well. So that's mainly what I do. I've been doing this since I was about 20 years old. So it's been about four years of um, doing this kind of work. But um, only recently, last year, I have noticed that there is a need to intersect these two vulnerable situations, you know, how climate change is impacting vulnerable communities and how um, queer activism is also a part of the solution to address how marginalized groups um, can adapt to the challenges of climate change. Yeah, I have to agree that uh, it is, uh, we should really uh, consider more, be, consider more to uh, actively participate in uh, climate crisis movement because uh, when we discuss uh, the movement for LGBTQ community. So what we usually talk is mostly about the criminalization of homosexuality, access to healthcare, and maybe this is not uh, really talked about in Southeast Asia, but I believe same-sex unions are also frequently yeah, in spotlight. Uh, I want to repeat it again. However, why is it crucial that our movement our movement, uh, the queer movement, also concentrate on environmental crisis. Yeah, and I think it's 
important to sort of like um, intersect both the LGBTQ community to the environment because um, a lot of climate justice activists happen to be queer, um, at least from my own personal experiences and engagement with young people in the Southeast Asian region. Um, I think we are a vibrant and creative society uh, and a very really uh, motivated, determined, uh, creative, passionate community. And I think those skills are very much appreciated in climate justice activism. But I also want to highlight that uh, it's important because um, it it highlights how vulnerable um, queer people are to the challenge of climate change, right? So you had, um, you know, things that we've been fighting for, like same-sex unions, um, you know, um, and uh, sort of a- sort of like uh, anti-LGBTQ um, laws that we fight against, uh, human rights violations. So those issues will be compounded or worsened uh, by climate change. Um, you would see how a person, um, you know, uh, residents would be, you know, affected by flooding or extreme weather events and how their partnerships status would, you know, uh, be sort of like a sort of like a barrier to seek, you know, uh, whether insurance or whether, um, um, you know, so some some sort of safety net. So you also have issues of how uh, different vulnerable groups such as trans women in Kuala Lumpur um, whose, you know, um, housing were recently af- affected by the floods in December of 2021 until January of 2022. So the, the, you know, the housing or for its homeless trans women were called, uh, seat, were organized by seat, by the seat foundation. And they were tremendously devastated by the flooding. And it goes beyond, uh, that. It also addresses issues that you've raised, such as, you know, um, sexual health concerns associated with um, LGBTQ people, our access to sexual health services. Um, you know, uh, people who are displaced by floods might be disconnected from HIV medicine. Um, we've seen these cases in Kuala Lumpur and um, Selangor in Malaysia where, um, you know, uh, men living with HIV um, were sort of from their access to HIV medicine because of those floods. So what are the challenges uh, or barriers faced by uh, the community in Malaysia uh, when participating in environmental initiatives? Environmentalism um, in Malaysia is such a vibrant and diverse scene. Um, like I said, a lot of environmentalists I've networked with personally um, happen to be queer and are very out there people who are also championing for the rights of LGBTQ people or activists um, who are also pro-environmentalism, right? So we do see those kind of uh, parts of society, uh, people of part of the society who are sort of aware of those things. Um, but the challenges that I want to address are based on sort of my own personal um, experience. Um, so these include, um, you know, uh, I've been called homophobic slurs by even the people that I trust within environmentalist circles. Um, who see my sexuality or identity as something to mock while fighting for the same cause. So I have had a very nasty experience with a homophobic person uh, who also happens to be an environmentalist uh, based in Malaysia and who also happens to go to the same university as I am. So I felt really unsafe by this person. Um, I have been rejected opportunities to speak at public events uh, um, and organizers have indeed cited that my involvement in queer activism prevented them from having me as a speaker uh, on on a climate change um, panel discussion. So, you know, those were some instances that I feel like are barriers of one person I am, and I can't speak for the majority of my community, but these are existing barriers where um, organizers and even people within the environmentalist circles might have very, very polarizing or hateful views when it comes to LGBTQ people in Malaysia. Um, and these are the things that I want to address. Uh, and, um, you know, uh, and I recently did a post on queer ecology on how I was recalling homophobic uh, experiences as a queer climate activist here in Malaysia. Uh, and I, I do not wish for any environmentalist who's, who happens to be queer to go through this, but these are real life experiences by my own. Um, and these are barriers to opportunities when you have organizers, uh, you have p- 
people who you think you can trust, making it not a safe space because of your sexuality or because of your identity uh, or because of how you express your gender. Yes, it's a very uh, thick wall uh, to bridge uh, for uh, for if you want to intersect uh, between queer movement and environmental movement because uh, it's not that common, right? Uh, it's not that long ago that we start to jump on another uh, activism because we're just circling around it, like I said before, in healthcare or in criminal law and etc. So, uh, in what ways uh, does the participation of the LGBTQ community in environmental issues contribute to promote uh, inclusivity and diversity within the broader environmental movement in Malaysia? Um, I think it's sort of a growing thing in the Southeast Asia region where our experiences with climate change effects like flooding are being documented and being reported. Um, the research is very minimal. The The published work is very minimal. The articles are very minimal, but it's out there and it's growing. And I think it needs to grow larger and ra- larger. Uh, and these experience, experiences are really important for policymakers, for researchers, for queer NGOs to document and report uh, because they do provide a sense of credibility to these uh, people who are doing the work, um, especially when they are going to publish it, right? Um, one one NGO in Malaysia, uh, Jejaka, which is a GBQ support group um, that does great workshops, um, uh, provide legal assistance for GBQ men um, and other forms of aid for uh, queer men in Malaysia um, have been fortunate. Uh, I have been fortunate enough to sort of give them a workshop on uh, the concept of queer ecology. Um, we did a nature-based volunteering initiative together. Um, so those kind of things exist um, and uh, have provided sort of like awareness and uh, and a sense of like um, diversity when it, when it comes to queer activism. So like Jajaka, which is a movement focused on GBQ um safety and 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 fighting for the rights of gbq men in malaysia have realized that hey we also need to talk about environmental issues and we've been really open about it and um and i think that's also an edge that a lot of queer communities have in malaysia and southeast asia i'm assuming and that we're always open to new things right we're also we're always sort of welcoming new ways to address how our community is affected and and that has provided inclusivity and and diversity um, not of just different sexes and uh, genders and and expressions, but also uh, of thought, right? Of of opinions and ways to mobilize ourselves. So there are lessons that um, que- queer a- activism can take from the climate justice movement. And there are also lessons from LGBTQ activism that the climate justice movement can adopt. Yeah, I have to agree uh, with you. Uh, environmental crisis is affected uh, everyone, uh, no matter who you are, in this world, queer or non-queer. But but you also mentioned that uh, we as uh, LGBTQ people, uh, as a community, we have our own unique experiences that need to be documented, uh, published, so we can uh, participate with our own uniqueness, we can bring our own matters in the movement. So. How do you, uh, with the LGBT movement in Malaysia, raise awareness about uh, the intersectionality between environmental justice and LGBTQ rights uh, in, in your country? Yeah, and I think, you know, um, what I've addressed earlier, Jujaka has been really supportive of this and they've, um, they've accepted um, uh, my sort of like role in um, sort of, influencing environmental um, initiatives within their own um, ways of activism or community work. So for example, like organizing a workshop or a or a session on queer ecology, we did a uh, volunteering initiative um, where we sort of like um, sort of did a cleanup project in a forest um, and sort of helped a nearby community forest um, discard um, its trash that were found in those forests um, and also sort of like were fixing the trails of the, that uh, community forest. Um, so these are like are some initiatives, but there are also like prominent climate justice movements in Malaysia that have con- like, have talked about um, how 
LGBTQ people are affected by climate change. Um, Klima Action, which is a local climate justice in Malaysia, um, has sort of like uh, worked together with a um, university club. I believe it's uh, Taylor's University, and they have sort of initiated this uh, program. Um, it was a talk, uh, a, a simple panel session on uh, feminist um, climate action. So they invited me as a speaker to sort of like give a perspective of a queer person when it comes to um, climate change. So um, these things are very minimal um, from my own uh, viewpoints, from my own experiences. But these are some initiatives that I have been really fortunate to be a part of. Um, and, and my only hope is to see it grow and grow and see that other NGOs uh, that are doing environmental work and other NGOs that are also doing um, queer activism um, sort of recognize that the two can work together uh, and the two should talk about issues of how differently uh, they correlate to each other. Yes, so what steps can be taken to further support and encourage uh, more members of the community to involve uh, in envir environmental movement or initiatives in Malaysia? Um, I think, um, so like some of the examples that I sort of mentioned, like the things that uh, in the previous, my previous answer, we can do more of that. Um, we can organize more workshops here in Malaysia um, particularly how climate change has affected Malaysia, which is, I think, the, the worst natural disaster that we have here is flooding, right? So how can we create more workshops to create a sense of um, flood preparedness amongst queer communities? Like how can the shelter for trans women be more prepared when it comes to um, the flooding season in Malaysia? Because we know that floods are going to get you know, much worse um, in the Southeast Asia region. So how can shelters, especially a safety net, a, a safe haven for queer people, uh, be sort of like built and have the infrastructure to be uh, more stronger against um, climate change impacts, especially flooding and uh, you know storms and so on, right? And other than workshops, I think there needs to be a published effort of how there needs to be a guide of community preparedness where other NGOs can like open and read this guide on how they can be better prepared to deal with flooding or other extreme weather events. The guide might in involve like, you know, uh, medication preparedness for uh, those that need um, queer affirming medicine or um, HIV medicine. Um, it's creating um, a sense of like which NGO can they go to when it comes to um, seeking shelters or seeking um, flood relief. I think those two would really be, you know, a great Kickstarter, you know, but I also want to suggest that uh, I think we can also adopt lessons from other countries. Um, the Philippines have created uh, MapBet, which is a map system um, that highlights, uh, you know, um, queer um, health services, shelters uh, for uh, those affected by um, strong, strong storm events in the Philippines. Um, so they've created this sort of system on where LGBTQ people in the Philippines can go to and see where they can seek shelter, where they can seek an NGO that can help them, where they can seek um, sort of like... Um, um, you know, um, sexual health services or healthcare services. Um, so that's a lesson we can adopt from a neighboring country. And the Philippines have done that. And there are also lessons in um, Indonesia as well of how, um, you know, uh, trans women in Jakarta have created sort of like um, storytelling of how they've been affected by climate change and how they're using um, different forms of artwork, um, performance, performances um, to sort of address the issue of climate change. And I think we can surely adopt lessons from each country uh, in the Southeast Asia region and compiled it into one very comprehensive policy report or a guide report uh, on how the community here and all of all the region um, can better equip itself to deal with climate change effects. Talking about uh, mitigation of risk, uh caused by the climate crisis. Uh, usually when we have, and when we create guidelines or uh, how, to pub, how to deal with a climate crisis, uh, the effect of climate crisis, 
it's usually for the general public so it's for for other people but should should mitigation uh, of the effect of climate crisis uh, be specific to queer communities or is it, it could or is it could be the same with the other people yeah and i think um i think creating a separate guide just for the community is important because we are constantly doing climate change mitigation and adaptation reports specifically catering to vulnerable groups. Of course, there are um, reports that can be more comprehensive that targets all communities. Um, but, you know, we do know the problem that it affects the queer, queer community disproportionately. So there's, I think there's nothing wrong uh, with adopting a very queer specific or queer outlook kind of um, report or policy when it comes to climate change mitigation and adaptation. And because if you look into adaptation, of course, there are strategies to help uh, on how to help trans women, on how to help, how to deal with um, queer people living with HIV, um, uh, to help, um, you know, uh, on how uh, the, how queer people are affected by um, extreme weather disasters uh, and how it affects their partnership status, uh, whether they can claim insurance or whether they can sort of um, have that uh, safety net or safety or social protection from the government and so on. Um, so I think those needs to be addressed in terms of policies. I think it's really important to have our voice uh, be reported. Um, so it so it gives us like credibility. It gives us um, a sort of like um, something that is ours, something that uh, that we can utilize, um, something that is sort of mobilized by us and for us. Yeah, so uh, what can we learn uh, from the env environmental movement uh, as a queer person uh, joining uh, in the environmental crisis uh, movement? And I think uh, vice versa, what can the environmental movement can learn from the queer movement, especially in Malaysia. Yeah, and I think how that is met in the middle is definitely the concept or theory of queer ecology. Um, you know, this is a very um, you know, uh, different way of looking at nature. Um, a lot of the conversations about homophobia or about you know anti LGBTQ rhetoric is that we are you know quoted quote. Uh, unquote, um, an unnatural society or an unnatural community, right? But what is unnatural, right? And that, that is nature. Nature is unnatural. Uh, nature is queer. Nature is weird. It's not on a straight line. We need to de deconstruct what is unnatural in the first place, right? So that's how we sort of me are met in the middle through this theory of queer ecology to say that queer identities do exist in nature, um, wildlife showing instances of homosexuality, flowers uh, in, you know, of asexuality, um, species of fish changing their sexes, um, you know, and, and uh, different bird species, um, you know, uh, showing um, expressions of transgenderism. We're completely a part of nature itself. So that's how I think the lesson is met in the middle, like the two communities can learn from each other. Because queer ecology was built on the foundation of the experiences and the critique uh, of how um, you know how mainstream environmentalism has been done, uh, and how we can incorporate a sense of queerness into it. Uh, and this is a very you know sort of polarized uh, theory, uh, but it is an exciting theory that both environmentalists and queer activists can learn. Um, I think uh, I'm also constantly trying to learn about queer ecology, um, but it's something that the two can learn when they're meeting in the middle. Uh, it's something that I think benefits both uh, groups because queer ecology also addresses the fact that uh, marginalized groups are affected by um, um, different environmental issues, um, that it also similarly reflects the fact that corporations is sort of this manifestation of, you know, um, of like a very uh, oppressive uh, capitalistic um, uh, entity that hurts both queer people and the environment. Wow, what a great answer. Queer is unnatural and what's natural is also queer. I think <laughs> that's a great closing statement.
So I think to close uh, this conversation, uh, is there anything you want to say, uh, especially to uh, people and uh, queer people in Malaysia or maybe in Southeast Asia who will listen to our conversation uh, tonight? Yeah, and I think um, I think my take ways I definitely encourage uh, you know the queer community to learn how to um, navigate or you know to basically like build more literacy or in or knowledge and awareness about environmental issues and how it affects their community. I think that's a very important uh, thing that I think everyone should be aware of how environmental issues or climate change affect different communities differently. Um, and I think that's something that uh, we need to build, you know, um, awareness needs to be built uh, more and more. I think we cannot have queer liberation, uh, you know, without climate justice and climate justice cannot exist um, without, um, you know, queer liber liberation. So I think the two needs to be uh, met. And I think um, organizers um, can start trying to design workshops in addressing this intersection or or, or uh, give more talks or more write more articles or I think uh, or publish more work or policy papers and reports about how the two should be met um, in a way that addresses both the issue of the environmental degradation but also the human right concerns that affect queer people. Thank you Ideal for coming and talking uh, in our podcast. Uh, so for those who want to listen to other podcast episodes, follow ASEAN Soji Caucus on Facebook and Twitter at ASEAN Soji and on Instagram and ASEAN Soji Caucus and also on Spotify. And this podcast is produced under the Creative Commons license. Thank you, Ideal. Uh, I, I I can wait to talk more about queer ecology because it is some things I am also passionate about. And uh, have a great night and we'll... See you very soon, I hope.